We are live. Welcome to Coffee with Ryan. Today I have a special guest, the anonymous philosopher. We are going to do this on audio only because there is an anonymous philosopher here. So we have to keep it anonymous. So I don't know how exactly to get my video off, but I'm just going to turn my camera upside down and uh, your audio pickup might not work. If you do. It'll work because it picks up right there. Okay. I'm pretty sure it will work. Um, oh, I won't be able to. Do you care if I keep it on me? Yeah, I don't care. No. The, we'll That's just be interviewing an anonymous fellow. <laughs> um, so there we go. It's just on me. And then when comments come in, I can read them. Um, so basically, we touched into this last year a little bit when we talked. But what we talked about was this idea of two trinities. Why don't you walk us through how you got into that and where it led you? Well, uh, I guess first I'd say that, so it's actually a little bit of a misnomer to think of uh, there being two trinities because uh, on the Christian side, they call it the Trinity. On the Neoplatonic side, they call it the triad. Okay. And it seems like it's a insignificant difference, but it's an important one because uh, on the Christian side, there's a essential unity to it, which doesn't exactly follow on the Neoplatonic side. There's a slight difference there. Um, but I got into it through uh, studying what I love. I was just really interested, and honestly, I thought there was a uh, derivative nature. So I thought that somebody was ripping somebody else off, which wasn't uncommon like in the ancient world. Like They considered that to be an honor. Right? So you write in the name of somebody who you respect. And so I might like write... Plato the, and Socrates? Right. Exactly right. So I might write in the name of Ryan, not because I am trying to pretend to be Ryan, but because I'm trying to represent the teachings of Ryan, right? Right. So this wasn't uncommon. And so I just assumed that someone had gotten in there and had, what we call today, stolen right. some of these ideas and had taken them, and took, taken them in a different direction. Um, but I did not find that to be true once I got into it. So it was interesting. Wow. What led you to that assumption? Um, well, honestly, because there's such weird ideas, mm -hmm. right? Uh, when you think of, when you think of what is really being said, when you look at the Christian Trinity, it is bizarre. It is one of the essential mysteries of the Christian faith. Um, you have three people, three persons, one being. Right? So it's well, a way to think of it would be three facets of the same being. Mm -hmm. And to see that repeated in another really contem at the same time contemporaneous uh, set of thought was almost, it's just, it seemed to me to be almost impossible that uh, Plotinus would have come up with the same set of ideas at the same time as the, the Christian bishops were. It's yeah. weird. Can you walk people through, or new to these ideas, the difference between Platonic and Neoplatonic? Uh, sure. So, um, well, because okay, so this is a good example of the, what I was talking about before, where people are taking other people's ideas and representing them the, as their own. So, uh, Platonism is the school of thought which really comes out of the works of Plato uh, and his master Socrates um, uh, around, let's say, roughly 500 BC. Um, it's where... I would argue Plato sort of invented the whole idea of real philosophy. Um, and he wrote his books, and you have the Republic, you've got all those other great works. Um, and over the years, these were studied by other philosophers and uh, understood, right? So everyone following Plato, in the Greek stream at least, uh, owes a, a debt of gratitude to Plato for his work. So Aristotle went off in a slightly different direction, but he owes a lot of his thought to Plato. Even when they disagree, he's disagreeing with Plato, mm. right? And so you go down through the Stoics, and the Stoics owe a lot back to Plato. And you get down into uh, Plotinus, who's brilliant, um, and he was studying Plato. And this is around, again, you forgive me for being imprecise, but I think it was around 100 AD. He was reading Plato, and he started writing about what he uncovered within the, the writing of Plato. And um, he was not trying to be new. 
he wasn't trying, right, so Neoplatonic means the new Platonists. Mm -hmm. uh, he wasn't trying to be a new Platonist. He was trying to write what he thought was true about Plato in his own way. And, but he inspired this whole new school of thought. And uh, out of it came some other really interesting writers like Iambilchus and a whole bunch of other guys uh, who were writing in similar ways about these basic ideas. Um, but what they primarily focused on uh, was Plato's work on uh, the realm of the form. So mm -hmm. his Plato's idea, uh, and this is a very, very rough summation, was that um, the world as we see it is not real. Um, the true reality lies beyond the world, and it filters to us through a series of regressions. And so the best analogy, or one of the best analogies that he provides, is the man in the cave. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And if you're looking in a cave and you can only see shadows on a wall, you would believe that that was true reality. But if you are released from your chains and you turn around and you start to see the light, it will blind you at first, but through time and patience you can come up out of the cave and see in the true light of the sun, which would be scaldingly blinding. Um, and he puts this, this analogy is his idea of uh, the shadows on the wall is material reality, right? It's mm -hmm. the world in which we live and breathe today. Um, mm -hmm. Turning towards the light would be turning towards what he called the world of the forms. And the forms are... Um, let's use air quotes and call it true because mm. there's, there's another level beyond the true here um, which Plotinus really latched onto um, but things like beauty so you see beautiful things we talked about this yesterday and they seem beautiful but the, they are not beauty itself right? and so once you start seeing that there is a commonality between beautiful things and that is what we call beauty the beauty would be the form, the form of beauty. And the forms, in the analogy of the cave, would be the light coming from the open, opening uh, in the cave. Creating the, the play of shadow. That's right, the shadow on the wall. And as you get out into the light, the blindingness of it is because it is so powerful, so, so much richer and truer. Yeah. And really, the ultimate reality goes even beyond the forms, and that would be the sun itself. Right? And which you can't look at even once you're out into the open air. If you look at the sun, it will just blind you, right? Yes. Uh, even if you are used to it. Now, you'd mistake at each stage along the way that is true reality, right? So when you're stuck in the cave, you think the shadows on the wall are real. You get out into the light and you're blinded at first, but as you adjust to it, you think, oh, this is real. But what you come to realize is that, well, the sun is actually that by which you see it all. Okay. So it is the source of all light. Right. So it's a really interesting idea. And, wow. Uh, so in that beauty example, so beauty is a form in of itself, essentially. Right. Right. It is a not ultimate reality, but it is real in a way that the shadow wouldn't be real. Right. Yes. Even a beautiful shadow. Because shadows can be beautiful, right? Yes. Yes. Um, great. Well, I'm going to check on some comments here. Welcome, everyone. We're glad that you're here. Uh, we've got a few, few listeners writing in, uh, so Griswold Grimm says, so Plato's Neo, Plato's cave is a Neoplatonic idea, question mark, also sounds Gnostic. Uh, well, the Gnostics are, yeah, the, uh, the Gnostics are a really interesting group. Uh, Plato's cave is, is Platonic, but, uh, if you think of the cave, it is a really, really good way of breaking into sort of the Neoplatonic ideas which took Plato's work and rarefied them, made them more elevated. So most of Plato's writing was for people, right? Uh, Plotinus wasn't, he was writing more pure philosophy uh, rather than uh, a dialogue between people. It was more rarefied. Um, but Plato's Cave is a good example of how Neoplatonic uh, understanding of the universe functions because uh, Plotinus took those ideas in that simple analogy of the cave and he reduced that down to a total metaphysical and even physical understanding of how the universe functions right he took that example and he he used that to come up with a whole system of, of thought completely now the gnostics really they're a super interesting example because they are uh it's a christian sect do you know who the gnostics are yeah, I mean, I've studied them briefly. I, I get uh, questioned about the Gnostics rather often, though. Um, <laughs> I have a book on the Gnostics. Oh, do you? Yeah. Let's see. 
I don't, I can't remember where it is. It's somewhere hidden in there. here somewhere. I haven't ordered um, it properly yet, but. Um, well, the thing that, that I know about it is that it was, it was sort of within the Christian tradition, but also not fully approved of by. So, but it was definitely, what I've gleaned from it is this idea that you learn and you contact God through experience and direct, direct experience rather than simple speculation. Is that? I, 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 I temper that a little bit. Correct me where I'm wrong. Yeah. So, so my understanding of Gnostics, and I haven't studied them super deeply, is, More that, than me. is that they believe that you are saved by knowledge, right? And so the knowledge that you gain is what saves you. So okay. in the modern church, well, okay, modern is relative here. We're, we're right. moving towards millennia, uh, is that there's an argument between whether or not you are saved by faith alone, so your beliefs and your understanding, or by the works that you do. Okay. And there's a resolution to this argument, which comes up later, but... Um, the Gnostics would have held it's by faith alone. It is by what you believe and understand. Okay. And so they were a sect. It was one of the first Christian heresies. Yeah. Um, determined later on that it was a heresy. Uh, where they believed that uh, what they had was they had the secret teachings of Christ. And the, if you understood and knew the secret teachings of Christ, you would be saved. Okay. And one of the things which they argued is that uh, Christ could not be both fully man and fully God. And so he's, who are, Griswold. Griswold, yeah. Absolutely onto something which is very, very true. And this is actually part of the reason why I believed that these were derivative theories. Okay. It's because the Gnostics were using Neoplatonic thinking uh, as they developed this. They, they argued, and this is the exact same argument that Plotinus made. I told you earlier, Plotinus didn't think very highly of the Christians. Right. This is exactly why, is that... Uh, the idea that the divine, true divinity, could be in the body of a physical thing is, to Plotinus, so silly that it's not even worth contemplating. Because that would be like saying you could have true light inside of a shadow, right? Right. Right? You see the shadow by the light, right? right. The shadow is the absence of the light, right? right? And from his perspective, what the Christians were saying is that you've somehow put light itself, the sun itself, into a shadow, right? They kind of are saying that. They are. Yes, they are. The, the, right? Yes. The, this is part of where it gets really complicated for the Christians. Yes. Um, that is exactly the argument. And so the Gnostics said, well, that's ridiculous. And this is before the Council of Nicaea, right? So this is before there was a true definition of the Trinity. The Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost didn't come fully into being until... Uh, 315-ish. Okay. Um, that Council, Council of Nicaea made that a formal teaching of the church. Um, but, yeah, the Gnostics were absolutely on that exact same train of thought. And, yeah. And you can find these threads running throughout uh, the different, let's call them schools of thought within the early church. Yeah. Which is, again, why I, I was really strongly of the belief that this was a derivative thing. They were, they were stealing from one another. So... Can you walk us through the similarities between the the philosophies that you saw that seemed suspicious, <laughs> um, to say the least, and then maybe start us there, and we'll we'll move towards what conclusions you eventually came to. Um, well, okay. So in terms of similarities, so uh, really, so for the Neoplatonic uh, triad, what that really is is it starts with the One, which is in the analogy, would be the sun. But it's much more than the sun, right? Because we know that the sun is... We see the sun as light, and the analogy is a relevant one. But um, Plotinus would say that the one is entire, is everything. There is nothing but the one, right? The one is, in and of itself, utterly indivisible, utterly incomprehensible, utterly in and of itself. The one... And you find a lot of similarities in thinking in the Christians on this side, with, with the one at least. The one is the easiest thing to uh, relate to the Trinity, mm. uh, is entirely focused on itself, and its understanding of itself is not different from itself, right? It's purely experience, and it, right, even use it is not right. The one's experience is the one. Okay. The one is not aware of anything outside of the one, because that would imply duality. Okay. There is no, the one is the one. So the one is one aspect of the Trinity, or that's the whole Trinity? For, for the Neoplatonic thinking, 
for the one, the triad, the, the central part of the whole philosophy, it is ultimately and in every single way a unity. Okay. That's why it's called the one. Okay, got it. Now, on the Christian side, so thinking Trinitarian thought now, you have the creator, the father, right? right. And the father is there in the beginning. Right. There was God, yeah. right? And so in the beginning there was God. And so God is that central focus, the creator from which all other things spring. And you'll see in a second that the one leads to the creation of everything else, but does not itself create anything. And the father... So that's where you get into the unmoved mover. Yes, that's, that's exactly right. That's the Aristotelian... Yes, yeah. that's right. And the unmoved mover is the one. Okay. Or is the father. Okay. Because when you get into, so going from the Father, or the One, down to the next, let's call it emanation. So the next emanation down on the Christian side would be the Logos, the Son, which we Christ. think of as Christ, yeah. right? Um, and that is the divine reason. So Logos is a way of using the term reason. And for the Father, it is by the reason that the world comes into being. So for the Christian uh, side, it is... Uh, through Christ that the world is made. Mm. Um, on the Neoplatonic side, what comes out of the one as an emanation, not through an act of will or anything else, but just as a, as a byproduct of existence, is the Logos. Same term. Uh, and from the Logos, which is the divine spirit of reason, comes the forms. So the Platonic form. So beauty mm. is an emanation from... The Logos, okay. right? And so these yeah. are high, high-level orders of being. Yeah. Um, to move quickly through some I'm very... I'm geeking out right now, man. <laughs> this is, it is going to really come <laughs> pretty cool. So, so let's, let's go one level further, because there's another level for all of them, which is uh, on the Neoplatonic side, is the Noose. And so the Noose okay. emanates out from the Logos. Yeah. And the Noose is spirit. And spirit, in its effort to be like the Logos, so the Logos creates the forms, okay. noose creates the material world, right? Okay. But each level out from the one is less perfect, less divine. And so it is, the noose is unable to perfectly recreate the, the form of beauty, and so you get beautiful things, right? Okay. And so on the Christian side, and the spirit is, the Holy Spirit is harder. The Holy Spirit is very, very complicated and is not nearly as well uh, described in Christian literature as um, the Father and the Son are. But the Holy Spirit is the wind upon the waters, which is the actual will of, right? So it's the will of the, the Son, which creates things, right? So it, you, you see the same pattern repeating itself, is you have the Father, the Son, the Father is using reason to create the the universe and the universe is created by way of the of the spirit. Mm. So the sun, it's really cool stuff. Yeah. So super fun. You thought that somebody had ripped somebody off. Yeah. Yeah. And how long did it take you to part from that idea, and how did you end up parting from it? it took me a long time, years of study, because you get all these gray areas, right? The the Gnostics are a good example of where they overlapped. Yeah. Right. Because. These were occurring in the same culture at the same time. Yeah. Right? And so you get the Gnostics who read some Plato. Yeah. And they come up with the same issues that Plotinus would take, but they consider themselves to be Christians. So this intermingling of ideas made the whole water very, very muddy. It's very, very difficult to tease them apart. What I had to do is I had to go back through, uh, is it Philip the Judaizer? I can't, there's these early Jewish thinkers right around the time of Christ who are working on these similar ideas. And so I could trace the Christian thinking back through those, those thinkers back, back into time. Okay. And so where I think they overlap is actually at Plato. I think that uh, these Christian thinkers, and they were educated people, right? You get Paul, Paul was a very educated man, uh, who I'm sure, I, had, I can't prove, but I'm sure were exposed to the works of the Greek philosophers. And so through that, you have these streams which come up together, but they are divergent streams. Um, I believe, I argue, I argue they're different. Right. And you thought that they were similar for several years. Yes. And you 
through arduous research <laughs> and painstaking reflection, you came to the conclusion that no, these are actually two completely separate trains of thinking that have some convenient parallels, but point ultimately to the same truth. Is that right? Well, and that's, I think, it's the best way of explaining the conclusion to which I come, is that both are pointing towards the truth, right? And these are people who are genuinely inquiring after what is true. Right. And in that inquiry, they start from different places, but they end up with remarkably similar yeah. understandings. There are other possible explanations, but my conclusion would be that there are, there are two different places at the base of a mountain looking up towards the same peak. Got it. Okay. I'm going to read some of these comments and questions here so you can address them. Um, I've got some interesting comments here. Okay. Um, so Grizz says, did I miss the place that... Explain the part that explains the Neoplatonic tr Trinity. Then he says, "Oh, there it is." <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Spartacus says, "Neo is the one." <laughs> <laughs> that's, Funny. That's yes. true. <laughs> well, and it's right. So remember, Neo means new. Yeah. So actually, the Matrix, which I I really enjoy, the Matrix is a philosophical. Really. Yeah. Oh, it's great. Um, he is the new Messiah for that movie. Yes. That's why he's so mis. He's such, he dies the way he does at the end of that. Sorry, right. spoiler alert if you haven't watched The Matrix <laughs> you haven't watched series. The Matrix in the last <laughs> 20 years since it's been out, it's okay. You can spoil things after a year or two. Okay. okay. That's fair. Fair game if you haven't seen it yet. Um, okay. Uh, Griswold Grimm says, my head is substituting source for the one. Quote, unquote, source. Um, is that... I need I need more information about more, what more context. Mean, yeah, for what he means by the source, the um, source of all things, perhaps. Yeah, right. So that might be right. Right. But yeah, there's a number of different analogies, and so it would be it is an acceptable thing to think of the fountainhead of a stream as being like the one, right? It is the place from which it springs. The river comes out from that yeah. by its own nature, right? Not by the nature of the spring. So that is a the thing. You, yeah. In that particular way, it, it's not inappropriate. But the best analogy really is the one which the Neoplatonists themselves would use, which is the sun, right? So the sun would be the source of light. Mm. The light is that by which we see, right? So you yes. have these layers of emanation. Yeah. Um, I, so I think it can work. Got it. But okay. if you're using anything Neoplatonic, you need to use the word one because it holds much more meaning than like using the term sun would work. It has to be the one. Um, it's like in um, Islam, Allah Akbar, right? So God is greater. This is a very Neoplatonic idea, right? Even your idea of God, even your idea of the one is not the one, because you have an idea of it. The idea exists here in your okay. head. And it is greater than that. The unity is its essential nature. There okay. is no essential nature, because that is unity. Unity is it. Got it. It is perfect and complete, and yeah. Got it. Okay. Neoplatonism is, it's very, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds like... Well, I'm going to let the audience keep interviewing you. It makes my job easier. That's why, I, that's why I'm doing it live, you know. Then gonna make you the audience is doing my work for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for all the great questions. Um, Spartacus says, ultra interesting. I'm doing stuff with my, my, my kidder ground, so I'm going to give this another proper listen later, I imagine. Shane, that's great. We're, we're glad to hear that you're getting something out of it. Shane says... Great topic. I've been trying to learn more about Plato. I heard that Platonic ideas were utilized by the church to make it approachable and legitimate to intellectuals. Any clarification? Um, no, I think that that's, I think that's true. Um, and it's, Plato is recognized by the church as speaking the truth, right? So Is that right? Yeah. Wow, he, he's not a saint, right? But um, you find uh, these early philosophers cropping up in... Uh, Oh, I think it's the Inferno. I think they're in... Like Dante's Inferno, yeah, right? Yeah, I think yeah. that he's... I think they're... I can't... It's been so long since I read those books. But I'm pretty sure they're in a city in hell. 
but it's a decent city. It's not like, <laughs> it's not the pits of sludge or the fiery icy, yeah. right? It's a place where everyone's like, they're, they're chill. Right. It's, they're not in a great place. Right. But you know, inside that city, it's okay. okay. <laughs> um, uh, but if you really think about what Plato was talking about in his metaphysics, in his metaphysical work, it really does dovetail very, very easily into the early Christian thinking, right? Which is really what I, where I concluded is that those early Christian thinkers were reading Plato. And they okay. were understanding what he was saying and they were um, bringing the truth through, right? So that's that, what you initially thought. Or well, did no, you still stay with that? I think, I think that that is accurate. Okay. I, what I really thought was that either the church fathers of the Council of Nicaea had read some Plotinus and were like, I'm taking this as my home. Right. Or Plotinus had been really? secretly listening in on Paul's <laughs> dialogues. He was like, I'm taking that for my home. I'm going to give no one any credit for it. <laughs> but that, that is not true. No, I think they both owe a debt of gratitude to Plato. Right. And um, earlier before we streamed, we talked about how Jung had the idea of archetypes and how maybe there are these ultimate truths in reality which we can come to from different angles, but ultimately lead to the same place. Which, in a way, is really a Platonic idea, right? So if yeah. you use Platonic, yeah, it is a Platonic thinking of the form. Yeah. Yeah. An archetype is another way of saying a form. Yes, that's um, right. In a way, he does other things with it, right? But yes, yeah. and yes. I'm not—I'm not a student of Jung. You actually probably understand Jung better than I. But yeah, well, and same with you for Plato. So I think it puts it positions us to bridge that well. gap. You know? Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, Jung definitely made some differentiation with the idea of forms, but there's a lot of overlap. But to your your listener, um, really, if if you're interested in those things, then I'd encourage you to continue that area of study. It's a really profitable one. Um, read through uh, the writings of Plato, and at the same time, read some of the writings of the early church fathers. They're, they work well together. They are, they are bedfellows. Okay. Say. Yeah. Okay. They're, Great recommendation. They're not at war. <laughs> yeah. I hope, I hope people go do that. That would be cool. Um, F. Gilbert says, A beautiful overview of these ideas can be found in the lectures of John Verveke. Ooh, cool. Um, yeah, he's a he's a he's actually from the University of Toronto, ah, which we were, we're we were talking, talking about, about how much you liked that place yes, earlier. That's really good. And um, great classics program. Yeah, he's a he's a great professor, and he's got a YouTube channel where he puts out lectures for free. So well, I'd recommend checking it out, everyone, if you haven't yet. And I would probably say he's going to do a better job than I am. <laughs> yeah, well, I am a student. We're all students in the end. Um, and I think you're doing great. I think it's captivating. I do. Uh, Mercury says, hello, all. Welcome, Mercury. McFace says, hello. McFace says, is there a connection between platonic theory of forms and archetypes? Well, there we go. Yep. Yeah. Got um, right on the head. Well done, Ryan. Yeah. Should we expand on it a bit? Um, well, if you want to take a moment to talk more about what the archetypes are. Yeah. So the archetypes are essentially represented by images, right? So it's similar to the world of forms. Their, their images for a second. Somebody was just calling me on the phone, so I apologize for the quick lapse in time there. Um, but basically the idea was that the archetypes are represented through images, primordial images. So they're represented through uh, whether it's, for example, you can have the archetype of a warrior, mm -hmm. right? The, that's the archetypal image. But Jung made a differentiation between the image and the archetype in of itself. Okay. So the archetype in of itself is a deeper primordial substructure to reality as such. So beyond the image. Yes. It can't be seen. It can't be perceived. It can only be represented. Yes. So the image is representative of the archetype yes. as such. Well, I, I think that that is a good way of thinking of the forms, right? So the yeah. forms, you, they're essential to the nature of reality, and they are not... You could never perceive... You could never perceive with your eyes, your mind, you can get a distant inkling of the nature of beauty itself. Yeah. Right? Uh, where they might differ, and I don't know Jung well enough to, to know this, is uh, for Plato, right? The forms are not themselves, they're not, let's say, they're not extant unto themselves. They have a derivative existence which comes from something beyond them. And he doesn't define it nearly as in depth as Plotinus does, right? So right. Plotinus expands upon the one, and you get, but you get hints of it in Plato. And so the forms themselves come from something greater. 
I don't know Jung well enough to know if that's echoed in his Well, work. I think to Jung, it's a web of being, a web of uh, patterns of energy within um, the psyche, okay? So Jung focused more on the receptor for the image, and which you, is... Just because I want to make sure I... So psyche, to me, I think of the... Greek form, Greek word for something like soul. Right, and, it, that... and I would say that it would just be bridged now to the internal experience of you as a human being. Okay, okay. okay. So this, the, it, let's focus, inter, there's internal experience, so, and then there's external. Okay. So, um, Jung tended to focus more on how we experience the world. So, he was first a phenomenologist, and then shortly after, he, he attempted science mm -hmm. um but he he did them didactically like alongside one another but for jung the 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 truth was important insofar as you experienced it so we ex as human beings we experience the archetypes mm -hmm. so and then here we have the the kantian problem we, we don't know the thing <laughs> in of itself right we can't say for sure jung jung held that boundary pretty rigidly um, in his writing, we can't say for sure what's on the other side of that line. Mm -hmm. But what we know is these are experiences that are universal among humans. Yep. And that is where so he really he really traced it down to, uh, you know, looking at everyone's experiences, looking at mythology across cultures, seeing reoccurring motifs, exploring dreams, exploring symbolism, and finding what are those things that keep arising over time and millennia that seem to be beyond individual psychology and go into what he called the collective unconscious. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. So the collective unconscious is the, the world of images and archetypes as it is shared by us as a Spe species, essentially. Um, I don't want to go too far down that road because I don't want to detract from what you're saying. But what I want to say is how does that relate to... Where does that diverge or converge with Plato's ideas? Well, so it, it, there's parallels, but the thing to remember is that for Plato, these were divine, right? And uh, they were, they were not, so it's, it's complicated because we have these modern ideas of what God is. Uh, they were superhuman, right? They were beyond humanity, and they would exist before the creation of humanity, and they will exist after humanity is, is gone. Whereas the collective unconscious is sort of a shared human experience. And so in some ways, some ways, it's almost a human... Okay, construction isn't right. Yeah. I don't want to use that word because it, it has connotations yeah. which don't, I don't think you mean. Right. Um, whereas this would be imposed from the outside. Yeah, so, yeah, and that, that is a primary difference. Jung didn't go as far as, he, he, see, he, he had his beliefs about spirituality and he had religious inclinations, but because of his own scientific integrity, he felt the need to draw a line sure. between what's experienced and the thing of itself, right? The thing yep. of itself. So I think that, but for him, what happens in the psyche is real. Well, right, right. Um, is actually like debatedly to him more real. Right, it's meta real. Yep. Right, um, so that's for him the psyche is the most real thing. Actually, okay. Um, so then there there are a lot of a lot of definite parallels there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyways, let's get, let's get back to the comments. Um, yeah, I don't like taking up too much time talking because I only get you once a year. So <laughs> you know, I want to take advantage of that and let you speak more. Um, so I think we addressed your question, Mick Face, but if you have more to add to that, um, Adela Darling says, the one is absolute, question mark? Yes. Okay. Um, yes, uh, it's, uh, even the word absolute is not sufficient, right? So any human conception is insufficient to fully articulate. But you find the same thing on the Christian side, right? So the Father, the divine, is beyond comprehension, right? It's beyond our ability to articulate or understand. So this is another one of those parallels that I was like, aha, 
I figured out who's stealing from who now. Uh-huh. But I, it was all. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, the one, the one, as a Neoplatonic idea, is, is, I guess, if that makes sense. Everything else is derivative. The one is. Okay. And the one is eternal, is eternally focused on itself, but it goes even, so we think of it in human terms, right? So when you think about yourself, there's a separation of self and thinking. Mm-hmm. The one is not like that. The one is purest unity. Okay. Um, represented only by the concept of unity. So we bring the concept of eternal, but the one is and always will be. It doesn't need a concept of eternal, right? Mm-hmm. It just is. I was talking to another philosopher whom you know well, and they were saying that there's two ways to look at eternity as a consecutive repetition of moments or as that which transcends time, goes beyond time. Uh, which camp do you fall in there? Uh, I think eternal would be beyond time. Yeah, so, and that changes. I mean, that's much different than thinking the con- consistent repetition of a moment or moments. Right. That's a much different idea. Well, and when you think about sort of how the one leads to the creation, the one does not create, the one leads to the creation of... Your battery's going to run out. Um, oh. Well, yeah, while the one leads to the creation of... Battery's running out. ...everything, what that is is pre-existing before anything. Yeah. And will exist... Should the universe cease to be, right. the one would continue to be, yeah. right? And, but again, that's, that follows, again, the parallels between the one and the father and the trinity are very easy to make because that's the one, the father, was there before creation. Yeah. The, yeah. the father is uncreated, is, un, is just, he is. Yeah. Well, and right, thinking of Trinitarian, the way they present it, the father and the son, there was never a time when the father was without the son, right? The father came into being, and at the same instant, or even come into being is wrong, right? It just is. That's right. what you're... Yeah, it yeah, is. it and, just and, is. And yeah. from the father is the son. <laughs> right, right, right. But the father is the father, and the son is the son. The father is before the son, not in time, but in causation. Right? right, is in logical progression. Yeah. So, in the same way, you have the logos from the one. Yeah. It's really cool stuff. Yeah, that's fascinating. <laughs> let's let's keep rolling through these comments. My battery is low, so I'm gonna continue to. Uh, do you have a charger? Or? I do in my car, but I I might I might go grab it if we have to. But for now, let's keep rolling. And if if we run out of battery battery unexpectedly then you know why everyone um okay oh here we go we've got we've got some uh new comments here so i'm going to roll through some of these and uh only we only have to respond the ones that we feel absolutely okay pertinent okay so any comments about hermes trismegistus i don't know how to pronounce that to you Hermes? I know I know about Hermes, but... I, I know who Hermes is. Any comments about Hermes? Seems that you might know about him, they say. Uh, it, I, I need more, more context, because Hermes comes up in so many different ways. Hermes is uh, the Roman Mercury, right? So he's the, right. Worker, the, the planet close to the sun. Right. Hermes is the messenger of gods. Hermes, he, he's got a lot of different roles that he plays yeah. um, throughout mythology. Isn't he kind of a trickster? Is that somebody else? Sort of, but um, god of music and okay. Yeah, he's he's a complicated one. Most of the Greek gods are though, right? Greek gods are not simple. Yeah. Um, the one is simple, but Hermes isn't exactly simple. I need okay. I need more to be able to answer that question properly. Okay. And I'm not an expert on that. Okay. McFace, uh, F. Gilbert says at McFace the Platonic Eidos. Ed- were taken as the model for archetypes by Jung. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Jung did uh, consciously take from Plato for sure. Mercury says we should do we should record some readings of Plato for the channel at some point. That would be great. Yeah. That would be great to read Plato. Uh, McFace. So I'm going to skip a couple of these and get to the questions here. Uh, 
at Anonymous Philosopher, you're doing a great job. Verveke breaks it down and builds up from the from the ground up, where you as to where you talk from a place of already knowing. Winky face. Cool. Yeah, cool. Um, <laughs> Griswold says, I have this unresearched hunch that Greek gods were placeholders for archetypes and our current view of religion was egotistical and our current and our current view of their religion was egotistical quote unquote ancients were dumb <laughs> uh, misinterpretations dot 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 um there's yeah oh, there's definitely some truth to that uh, we think today right so if you read the mythology you've got these gods debauching themselves right and, um, the Greeks knew that they were not real like that like yeah so Plato had no Plato did not it, they so Plato and Aristotle scoff at the idea that the gods would come down and have sex with human women, right? right. That's not possible for the divine because the divine cannot become less than it is, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, today we read back over what you might think of as morality tales, right? So mythology is misunderstood today as being like fable, as fiction. That's not what mythology is. Mythology is an expression of archetype. It's an expression of the essential truths of the human condition they're symbolic of yes. something deeper much um, right so if you read through uh the odyssey for example yeah okay so skilla charbotis uh going between the many-headed monster and the the whirlpool it isn't necessarily true that there was a many-headed monster but it represents something to us yes and it tells a true story the idea of history as we currently have it today is one that was invented by Thucydides. I'll get that book right there. Um, the idea of history changed at this specific moment in time from being representation of what happened, as in what, what story, what, what do we need to know from this event? And that's what you see during the Battle of Troy, right? Is what is the, you hear it's all about the battle of the great heroes, mm -hmm. how the gods came down and got involved with the battle, which is what a listener would need to know from it to this new idea as to what actually happened, mm. right? Did you have this particular person killing that particular person? How many people were in the army? And in order to find that out, you do it in a totally different way, right? So to find out what truly happened, air quotes around true, because there's always a question as to what that means, um, he had to go talk to a whole bunch of different people to get different yeah. versions of the story. Whereas for uh, the writer of the Iliad, he just wrote the story, right? Right. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily, it didn't matter if you have Achilles killing this particular person, right? That's not the important thing. The important thing is that Achilles was Achilles, right? Right. right. And Achilles was unstoppable in battle. Right. Until, you know, Paris. Yeah. <laughs> but. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that you're pointing to in the uh, metaphorical nature of these forms, these archetypes or whatever these gods is we experience reality in that way so when anger comes we experience anger as a godlike force mars we, yeah we experience that uh aries or mars or whatever yes. and it's an instinct that is so compelling that we can't help but feel its yes. power. It is right? the word of a god yeah, spoken it, it, to us. Yeah, and, yes. and Jung was very adamant in fleshing that out as well. So it's a way of looking at reality that we're losing now. We're losing yeah. that way of appreciating the strength of experience and the, the compelling nature of different instincts that take over. And even how to make sacrifices to the right gods. Yes. You know, like... That's not just a superstition. That's a metaphor for the ability to navigate your life right. in a way that you're, you're not being run by the instincts or the emotions or the experiences, but you actually have some play and some influence over their rule. Right. right? Well, and when you think about how like, the, the ritualistic nature of religions, there is a... Right, that's an element of incorporating that idea into your daily life. The praxis of a religion yeah. is really built around how to incorporate the otherworldly, the divine, into yeah our daily lives. Yeah, and there's more to it, of course. Right, there's it always goes much, much, much deeper. But 
yeah, there's definitely some of that in there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, we've gotten off track, maybe. We've got a lot of comments to <laughs> keep up with here. Sorry. Are you doing okay so oh, far? Yeah, yeah. He's okay. All right. Talking about um, movies? Come on. How often do we get to do that? Yeah. This is awesome. Um, okay, I'm going to skip to... I saw Alexandria says I saw a documentary about this com concept by some ex eccentric philosopher, Rick and his assistant Morty. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah, be careful about those guys. The nihilists are read deep in Rick and Morty. Is that right? I, I enjoy I Rick and Morty, it. but it's it's uh it's nihilistic. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. Wow. He they look deeply into the void, and the void does indeed look back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh no. Nolan says, philosophy with Ryan. I like it. Yeah, we're having fun, aren't we? Um, Griswold. Oh, hold on. I want to see if this is a good comment here. To read. <laughs> I just want to be wise with our time. Myths are no historical account, are, no, are, are not so much historical accounts of days past, but rather points of recognition for archetypal patterns, triggering thought, says F. Gilbert. Yeah. That's well said. Yeah, that's, that's well said. really well said. Yeah. Mercury Black says, how do you apply this to practical inter practical interaction with the divine? Or how does this affect how you live your life? Great um, question, Mercury. As in, like, so to bring it back maybe to the triad and trinity question? Sure, let's start there. Yeah, it, um, well, on the Neoplatonic side, it would really change your understanding of the world in which you live. Right, so people today... Are, tend to be materialists, right? So they tend to think that the world in which you live is real. This is where I am. This is, I wake up every day, my existence is real because I'm surrounded by this material mm -hmm. stuff. You knock on wood, right? Mm -hmm. That's real. Um, the Neoplatonic idea that, and they get mad if you called it religious because it's not really religious in the, the traditional sense, um, uh, changes that fundamentally, right? It means that the material world in which you live is derivative. It is, and in their own perspective, it is vile. It is distantly removed from the divine. Mm -hmm. And so your desire to accumulate things, for example, is ludicrous to the absurd because you're gathering dirt to yourself, right? Yeah. You're wallowing in the lowest of the low. Yeah. And uh, the only way to become more is to try and emulate the highest level of divine that you can. And so for human beings, really, the highest we can get at most times would be short of, and mysticism gets really interesting, short of mysticism, mysticism is different, would be logos, right? Is the use of the, the small aspect of divine reason which we have in us okay. to emulate that and to understand the world in which we live. Okay. And so that experience means that your thoughts, your knowledge is far more real than the, the sandwich which you eat. Okay. Right? The sandwich which you eat is only necessary in a limited, frankly, dirty way. Right. Right? Whereas your perception of truth is divine. That is and again, I'm using, they balk at the term worshipful, but it, it's an analogy that works, right? Got so, it. Um, on the Christian side, it, if you look at, and this is why the Neoplatonists kind of scoffed at Christians, if you, if you understand what the Messiah was doing on earth, the teachings which were imparted, that changes fundamentally your day-to-day -day life, right? Because we were presented with, through the apostles, uh, an image of how to live, mm -hmm. right? And you do not get that from the Neoplatonists. They don't present you with an image of how to live, uh, except that it ought to be a life of quiet contemplation. You that's ought... it. That's, that's the fundamental... Right, lesson. which is Aristotelian, right? That's the... It goes... That's Stoic, right? It, the Greeks and Roman idea of the highest was very different from our idea today. Yes, got it. Um, okay, fantastic. So let's see here. So I've got people asking me, please go get your phone charger. <laughs> so they really don't want this to end, which is a good sign. Um, 
you mind if I go grab that? Go um, I'll leave you with a question. It's up to you as to whether you want to try to talk to yourself and these people. I talk to myself all um, the time. Or if you want to wait. So let me find a good one here. Dum dum. Let's see. All right, I'm finding a good one. Hold on. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. What are your thoughts on mysticism? <laughs> that should keep you going for a minute. I should have brought it up. <laughs> um, Be right back. Okay, so I'm going to relate mysticism to... Um, okay, it, mysticism is complicated. So mysticism, and I'm not deeply learned here. So this is not an area where I at all have any pretension to deeply understanding it. Um, but mysticism to me seems to be the effort to directly experience the divine reality. So if you think in platonic terms, it'd be rather than trying to um, understand, so use your reason, use the logos to properly um, be able to articulate, define, and whatever, uh, the divine, it would be more a question of trying to directly access and understand and appreciate, uh, sorry, my phone was ringing, uh, the one itself. So mystical experience purports to be, and I have no, I, I can't pretend that I really, uh, have ever had a mystical experience myself, but it purports to be direct perception, and perception is not the right word, but direct perception of divine reality. And so um, I know this best through uh, Islam, actually. So the Sufis uh, are a sect of Islam. It's a mystical sect, and you find mystical sects throughout most religions, actually. It's a really interesting pattern uh, where they, if you've seen the whirling dervishes, if you haven't, look them up. They're really Kind of amazing things, uh, but they they dance and they spin, and their goal is to through this act of religious activity to directly experience the divine reality, and so it's a it's a different branch from the more rigorous rationalist approach. However. If you hold that the one is the beginning point of all reality and that out of it comes the logos and mysticism would be direct access to the one, then they cannot help but be the same ultimately because the logos would be an articulation of the one Whereas mysticism would be more an experience of the one, if that makes sense. And what are you going to plug that into? You don't. I don't have a charger bit for that. I'm, I'm charging it from my computer because my oh, my phone. I see what you're doing. Okay. My computer doesn't have internet, so we're running this whole thing off my phone because the hotspot <laughs> wasn't working. So, bear with me. How'd that go? I don't know. You have no, <laughs> no idea. idea. I, I wandered. I wandered far afield, but I think maybe somebody said that? yes, indeed. Oh well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's something. That's a verification. <laughs> hey, we're talking about the Sufis. So. Oh yeah. What do you think about them? Oh, they're amazing. That's the risk of repeating yourself. Yeah, I think they're they're fantastic. Um, really? What I what I was basically saying to bring this around, uh, so you're up to speed, was. Uh, and to be really, really brief, is that uh, mysticism is the attempt to directly experience the divine. Yes. Whereas uh, more, so it directly experience the one. Okay. Whereas uh, most traditional religion tends to try to understand, which would be the expression of the logos. Right. Right. And so it's a different. It's a different thing. Gotcha. I just want to make sure this is charging here. Now, would you consider yourself um, a mystic, or what, what would you, like, how do you relate to that? I am rational. I'm a rationalist. I, I understand through reason. 
Um, so I, maybe the highest that I can experience would be Logos. Now, I know people who have had mystical experiences. Mm -hmm. um, so my mother, for example, has had mystical experiences yep. that are what she believes are direct access to the divine. Now, I have issue with it because I approach things from a very rational perspective. And so I ask the question, how can you... It's not repeatable. It's not something which we can measure. It's not something which we can understand as anything other than an experience. And so it's harder for me to take that and do anything with it. I don't deny that it's real mm. in perhaps a higher level of reality than I can experience through reason. Yeah. But I can't, it's beyond, it's beyond logos, it's beyond reason. Right. Right? And so it's beyond my understanding. But yet you have faith. I think so. Yes. I, yes, I would say yes. Yeah. I struggle a little bit with the I, with that because it's not... Well, because I have the idea, I think I have a different idea of faith than most people do. Okay. So I think of faith as being uh, knowledge of things unseen, not as in belief. Oh. Right? Yeah. And so for me, faith is the knowledge you have of the good, right? Okay. And so I have... Right, I struggle with that word because it's it's modern usage is so different from what I think of it as meaning. Um, but I here here's what I can say is that I have reason to believe that mystical experiences are real because of the commonalities that you find throughout them across all religions. That's right, right? Yeah. And so I am able to rationally perceive and understand them on that level. I have never directly accessed them. My mind has not been blown in that particular way. Really, right. What about like deep moments of connection or? I, I've never, I mean, I've had deep moments of connection, but I've never had, I've never had that. Mm. Yeah. How would you know if you had it? You think it would just be obvious? I think it would be obvious. You think it was just like so? If obvious. God shows if up like, for a cup of tea, I, I hope I What know. if just enjoying, like being really in the present moment and appreciating nature and having a sense of trust and joy in the unit. What if that was a mystical, yeah, like a low dose, like Maybe. a low, low dosage mystical well, experience. But, but what you're referring to then would be emanations, right? And so yeah, those I, I do have, right? Say more about that. Well, but so uh, emanations out from the one, it's not direct yeah. experience of the one. It's the, em and honestly, it's a lower level of experience yeah. than low. It's not like a revelation. Right. It's the noose. Right. And the noose is also divine. Right, we scoff at the noose if we are the logos. But as people, is that the with, Holy Spirit? The right. Noose? Yeah. Yes. But as people who are material, we are much below noose, right? Yeah. Which would be soul. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's in, interesting stuff. <laughs> More comments. It's amazing. All right. Um, All righty. Um, sorry guys, it's very difficult to everyone to keep up with comments on my phone since I'm usually on the computer. Um, let's see. <laughs> oh, Alexandria says, it's 2 a.m. and I was taking a five minute break from an assignment. I did not imagine I'd fall into this kind of rabbit hole. <laughs> I'm stoked. <laughs> That's Congratulations, always... <laughs> welcome to the party. <laughs> we were talking about procrastination earlier. Yes. Yeah, yes. it's always nice. Um, is the voice off camera camera intentional for a reason? Yes. Yes. Um... I have deep-seated opinions of various sorts which are not, um, let's call them popular. And so in talking about things which are religious in nature, I can run afoul of my employer. Let's yeah, say. fair enough. I, I, yeah. I, I totally get that. Sorry. Um, it's not that I don't like you guys. <laughs> we'll, just have to, we'll just have to make enough money on our channel to hire you. <laughs> Outcompete out your employer. Then we'll... <laughs> so I have a Guy Fox mask in okay. my office. It's... <laughs> I, can, I can come on with the Guy so Fox mask. That be, would be actually... Be truly anonymous. That would be... <laughs> No, I, I don't love want that. I don't, would I, you actually do that? No, because I'm not representative of the hacker organization, and I don't want them 
looking for me. Oh, you think it's a, hack, you think it's a ha- hack organization? Yeah. I don't know much about... No, Anonymous is a... There's a group when you, of... But hack means, like, it's fraud, right? Like, it's... Well, it's... Illegitimate. No, no, no. Uh, hackers are people who are, like, computer Oh, like, I was thinking hackers. of a hack. Like, no. He's no. a hack. No, no, no. Like, he's, no, no. A, he's, he's a clumsy hack. Nope, nope. You don't no, mean I mean, it like that. I mean, the, <laughs> the organization of computer hackers who call yeah, themselves Yeah, I now I know what you mean by that. Yes. You think they'd come after you? Well, I'm not part of the group. I, I can't you pretend to You can just that declare is. yourself, right? <laughs> I don't think there's any membership requirement. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess we're not going to be doing that. Um, but Mercury says hackers don't own the mask. That's true. Guy yeah. Fox was around before this, and I, I know it from older sources than the anonymous group. However, I, it's a hot mask. You don't. But want, I have the mask. The, the for overlying reason, theme so. is you don't want to draw unnecessary attention to yourself. Right. 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 I'm and sure. and I have the mask because I have some anarchistic tendencies so yeah alexandria says got it very sensible <laughs> um and uh pen testers is the modern term she says really yeah what is the modern term for what um, pen tester pen testers the modern term for what can you specify please and then mercury says alan moore wrote v before we were all online i didn't know that i have the book here Vigil Wait, Vendez. that's by Alan Moore? Oh yeah, Alan Moore's fantastic. Isn't Alan Moore like a genius that I don't know about or something? Because everyone keeps on talking about Alan Moore. And uh, Alexandria meant that, that that's the word for hack. Oh, it's right here. V for Vendetta by Alan Moore and David Lloyd. Wow. So this is how I know. You're really a big fan of this word. Oh yeah, Alan Moore's fantastic. Uh, his Watchmen books are really something else. If you haven't read them, you should read them. Uh, it is a well. These are an interesting exercise in understanding nihilism. So. Oh really? Alan Moore was he was good philosophically. Not that I agree with everything he's saying, but he was good. He's a, he's brilliant. I've heard. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Mercury, are well told. who's co-host on this channel, uh, is a huge Alan Moore fan. So that's great. I just haven't had a chance to check it out yet. You should Can't definitely hear. Yeah, right on top of Harry Potter. Yeah, which one should be on top? Uh, Alan Moore should be on top. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> gotta establish a hierarchy. Um, okay, so let's see if I'm. I know I'm missing stuff, everyone. So uh, let's see. Nolan says, "I think it's intertwined because remembering that you were once in the cave, once unconscious, unreceptive, will likely prevent you from falling in the trap." Is that right? Maybe. Um, maybe. But there are definitely... So if you, if you actually try to do this, then you will find there are moments where... I, okay, I can't say for you. I can describe my experience is that there are moments where I seem to forget, right? Where I know something mm. and I forget it. Or to use the modern term, I might believe something to be good and right and true and just in the morning... But then I lose my faith in it. So a good example of this would be um, roller coasters. I understand the physics of roller coasters. I, I understand how those work. I understand that it is designed in such a way that it really isn't feasible that you'd fall out. Mm-hmm. But if I were to get in line for a roller coaster with that belief and then get on, my faith would completely go away. And this is in the modern sense of faith. My belief in the, the trusting that in physics yeah. is gone. <laughs> right. right? And I would just be left with pure mindless terror. Right. And so there are moments, to use this as an analogy, there are moments where uh, things that you know are true are by the body, the matter, are overwhelmed. Yes, I, I, by, I, by fear or right. something like that. Or other passion, yes. But, I, uh, I have experienced this many times. Example, yes, one. or anger. So you know... Yeah. Like, let's say you're a Christian and you have a very like, defined set of principles and you know that going to the strip club is not within those principles, but you, you find yourself in a situation where Drawn you feel like anyway. those are the gods we were talking about earlier. Right. And now, that yeah. is not one of my particular weaknesses, but yes, right? <laughs> Wrath comes close. It was a hypothetical. I'm, right. I'm much more inclined to... Drink? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. But anger is, is probably the, the closest. I have anger too. Yeah, because I can get into a very... I'm pretty good at being dispassionate. 
Marcus Aurelius does a good job of helping me suppress my, or not suppress. What do you think about the meditations? I think that they're fantastic. Really? Oh yeah. Um, someone told me they were reading them recently and I, I wondered if it was worth a pickup. Definitely worth it. No, the Stoics, I, I take a lot from Stoic philosophy, but Stoicism and, and this is just my reading of it, I'm not, I'm not a deep reader of Buddhism, but uh, Stoicism and Buddhism co-relate in my mind. Yeah, the you're not the only one who comes to that conclusion. Yeah, and yeah. so the peacefulness you get of rising beyond emotion, passion, let's say, is a really important thing. It's, yeah. and we're, again, it's difficult because we use modern language differently than it was intended. So dispassion means that you are not affected by them. It's not that they're not there, it's that it doesn't dictate what you do. Okay. Right? But you should absolutely give them a read. Marcus Aurelius was very, very, very good. Yeah. All yeah. the Stoics are worth some time. Really? Yeah. yeah. So Seneca committed suicide at the command of Nero. He was a great Stoic philosopher. Um, Which era are we speaking about? Uh, Nero was... Roman? Yeah, he's yeah. a Roman. Obviously, um, Marcus Aurelius. Yeah. And, right, you have these examples of these great thinkers just, oh, you want me to die? Okay. Like, Socrates did that. Right. He was condemned by his city and rather than fleeing. And they had a boat ready for him. Uh, he just, no, I'll, I'll take the hemlock. It would be a betrayal of my principle, so I will stay. Yeah. Hemlock or not. Look after my what, children. What gives a man such conviction? Or a woman? A direct experience of the truth, maybe. Maybe it's that mystical... You or... don't think rationality could provide that steadfast commitment? I think it might. I do hope you, it would. Do you think you have it at all, or do you think you... I, you hope, would, I hope I'm never tested. If you tested. were tried and tested, would you... I hope I would, but yeah. I don't know. You don't know. No. But you've been... Everyone gets tried and tested at times. But to that extent? Not to that extent. That's... But everyone faces their own tests. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And... Well, but I'm not on camera, right? Yeah. So that's a... I would be inviting tests to be on camera. And so that's... I'm avoiding those. So maybe that's a lack of a lack of confidence. I don't know. I think it's a lifestyle choice. Like maybe. choosing to be public is you you're you're accepting the the potential consequence of that choice when when you do that. Yeah. You know? Like interesting. But it, well, I think we're on a sidetrack. Yeah, we're totally on a sidetrack. <laughs> The, the world of podcasts is full of many <laughs> sidetracks, many meandering trails. Um, that the world of podcasts that we find ourselves in are full of, you know, Joe Rogan, for example, who's the biggest podcaster in the world, pretty much. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, uh, does three to four hour podcasts. Holy cow! <laughs> and they, they get high listener retention, and uh, they're fascinating. But yeah, the the, the path meanders wildly. Uh, we we keep it more focused here. But, <laughs> um, well, this is your show. Yeah. You call the shots. I think the audience calls the shots today because they're giving us lots of good stuff to think about. Um, okay. Griswold Grimm says, people have used Nero as an insult against me. Yeah. But I like the name so it didn't hurt. Smiley face. Um, you should read about Nero. Nero was pretty... He was a pretty interesting character. He, right, he's, there's famous stories about him of questionable legitimacy. He's the emperor of Rome. He, uh, he was decadent. Now, these are Christian accounts, and the Christians did not like Nero because he went back to the sort of classical religion as opposed to being a Christian. But uh, playing, the, playing while the city of Rome burned around him. Oh, Because wow. he did not care. It was not, he didn't care about playing his Playing music? Is yes. that what you meant? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They say the violin, but there was no violin. Playing the, okay. Yeah. Wow. That's... He had pleasure barges, and he was dedicated to hedonism. I was just going to say hedonism, yeah. yeah. Um, Mercury wants to know, have you read Alan Moore's Jerusalem? I have not. Okay. Is that a graphic novel, I wonder, or is it... I think it's like a full-on, like... Novel. Philosophical book, isn't hmm. it? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I've never read it, but Mercury seems to love it. We've talked about it before. I'd be interested in checking it out. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's see. 
come on. Why? <laughs> okay, here we go. I've got it. Um, let's see here. Uh, Mercury says, if you take the afternoon.